Luke chapter 16, sorry, 17, Luke chapter 17. Let's take a look at this passage together, verses 11 through to verse 19. So, being married to an American, we celebrate Thanksgiving every year. And this passage has become a chair passage that I have often shared on that occasion with my family and friends because it really does encapsulate the heart of what it means to be a thanks giver. And so there's some lovely reminders um, in this passage for our mind and our brain. And um, even this week, you know, we were talking as a family and read this little article slash devotion and realized that, um, or learnt that in conversation, it takes very little time before in a conversation somebody has a complaint and it actually has an effect on your mind. And so it would be good to combat that, I believe, with what the Bible suggests as a thankful mind, a mind that is gripped by thanksgiving. And I'm hoping these next moments will be a time for you to do just that. Remember the context, though. We're coming out of a little section there called the unworthy servants, um, verses 7 through to verse 10. And the summary of all that was the privilege of being the king's servant. And that's kind of how we left church last Sunday. We um, had that in our mind. We are unworthy, undeserving. And what a privilege it is for us to be the servants of the Lord. And special reference to the king. Notice the next text talks about the kingdom. So what a privilege it is to be a servant of the king of kings. So that's ringing in our minds from last time. I have three points for this morning, but under each of these points, I've got little, I don't know what they are, but they're little um, subbies. I'm going to call them that, okay? They're little sub points, little subheadings that will just help you to hang this passage on a structure. So go ahead and write these down as I give them to you. They'll be on the screen as well. So let's consider firstly the magnitude of mercy, the magnitude of mercy. And the first little sub point that I have is the sub point, no coincidence. So we know this text quite well. Um, you can glance your eyes over just those few verses there, four or five verses. I'm going to highlight the explanation here. So please, just follow along in your Bible and you'll see verse by verse we'll tackle these ideas. Some suggest that it was quite clever on the part of the lepers to come to Jesus, needing physical help. And I look at the passage again and I realize, no, 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 it wasn't clever on their part. In actual fact, it was Jesus who came to find them. Look again. He passed through a specific area on the border of racial tension. He entered into a certain village, verse 12. And like many other occasions in the Bible, we see this as an example of Jesus holding a divine appointment with people that have to have their lives radically changed. And I'm always blessed by that. The effort that Jesus would take, the intentionality of Jesus to give us timeless lessons this, church family, is the mercy of our God. Listen for that phrase. This is the mercy of our God to find us when we are not looking for him. Amen. Be thankful for God's mercy in seeking you out this morning. And be thankful for God's mercy in finding you. It's often that I hear a, a testimony. If you're going to be honest, all testimonies reflect this. But it's often that I hear a specific testimony about God coming to snatch us out of sin and get our attention in the middle of running the opposite way from him, God finding us. This is his mercy, no coincidence. Second little sub point is no rest, no rest. Jesus was tired. He'd been traveling on foot. He had been through some serious, serious uh, ministry in the last little while, of, as we've seen. And he comes into this new village. There's stress and vexation flooding his mind. The toil of all of this um, taking its effect on the humanity of our Savior, no doubt. And he saw need and responded to the cry, look at your Bible, immediately and without protest. There's no rest for the Lord. And that's so true of God right now. This is the mercy of our God, to notice and respond to our cry. He's never too busy, he's never too tired, he's never distracted. He doesn't take rest because he is omnipotent and so he is ready and available Always to address our need. One more little subpoint: No partiality. He was met by ten lepers, the scriptures tell us. Nine, it seems, nine Jewish 
and then one Samaritan. And I was just smiled to myself, amazing how mis misery loves company. You know, there would be huge enemies otherwise, but now in their trauma and in their sickness and disease, um, they flock together. And that's so true of our life as well. When trauma strikes, think of our recent history here in KZN, it's amazing how enmity fades, right? It really is. Surely this should be true in the church as well, that when we battle against sin, which is our greatest stress in life, we shouldn't have time for prejudice and for racism and for bigotry and things like that. Dr. Luke tells us that these guys were sick, as in very sick. And being a medical doctor, he knows what he's talking about. They were therefore outcasts ignored by healthy people. They were what society would call the unlovable of society. And they knew it because they kept their distance and they're shouting from afar. This disease was highly contagious. And so, again, this is the mercy of our God to care for the outcast. Do you agree? I mean, it's just a beautiful picture of Jesus in his fatigue, not showing any partiality, but addressing need for those that would probably continue to be needy and unhelped. In theological circles, we refer to this as unconditional election. Our election is not contingent upon race or creed or status or accomplishment or upbringing or circumstance or reputation, anything like that. Jesus makes a special effort to cleanse lepers as our punishment taker, or I like to refer to it as our wrath absorber. This is the work of our Savior to reverse the effects of the fall. Notice the approach. It wasn't haughty. It wasn't demanding. It wasn't even specific, like heal our leprosy, God. It wasn't that at all. It was generic. It was humble. It was submission. Commander, you'll see it in your Bible as master. Commander, you know what's best. Have mercy as you see fit comes out of their mouth. It's better because it's better that you act according to what you consider to be most wise because you know more and what, who are we to suggest a course of action in light of your sovereign, wise, and good commanding of the universe? No partiality. This is the magnitude of mercy. Second, let's see the test of trust. The test of trust. And I've got three little subbies here as well. Firstly, no promise. They believed, well, I, sorry, they did have some measure of like, uh, they came to Jesus saying that he could heal. But I believe at this point Jesus knew that they would be healed and that they would be ungrateful for it. This is the sovereign omniscience of Jesus while he walked on this earth. But he still sends them to the judge, the leprosy judge. The, the priest would be the one that would determine who would be unclean and who would be clean. And notice when he sends them, there's no promise of any cure because this was a test of their faith, a test of their trust. You see, theologically speaking, or biblically speaking, faith needs to be demonstrated. And faith can be demonstrated, hence the book of James, for example, by our obedience. It can be tested by our obedience. So if you are waiting and you are praying for God to step in to help you with a miracle, how about this suggestion? Get busy obeying the Lord. I mean, so many come to me and say, well, I don't have any time for God because he hasn't helped me with my struggle when I've cried out to him. And I'm saying, yeah, but you, you haven't shown any fruit of obedience. You haven't shown any desire to follow Jesus or to listen to him or to make time for him. So it's hard for God to answer prayers when you're kind of ignoring. It's, it's, it's an oxymoron to say, well, God's ignoring me when I'm ignoring God. So take the steps of faith and be obedient. There was no promise of healing. Secondly, no protest. No protest. Jesus, we've been there before and they kicked us out saying that we were unclean. So we know that we're unclean. Or Jesus, we came to you. Now are you telling us to go? Or, or Jesus, start the process. Like I always smile about this. Heal the finger and then, or put a finger back on. Because literally this disease meant flesh falling off and things like that. Horrible. You can read about it. So, so heal my body some degree and then I will go. Because it's going to be a big trick and a big mission. And I don't really see the 
benefits of me going to see the priest now. Because look at us. I mean, we white as snow. This disease made your skin turn white, apparently. Jesus, I just don't believe that this is going to be any benefit to us. I don't trust you. There's no protest. When God says go, go. And all of these respond that way. My advice would be, through this passage, stop protesting God's advice. Stop protesting his guidance in your life. Stop protesting his word. Stop arguing about God's methods. And start submitting to him. Amen? We know the word. We know the truth. We know what he has said. Thus saith the Lord. So our response should be, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. One last little subby here, no problem. There's no sweat for Jesus to heal. As they went, the Bible says, they were cleansed. Now just know this. Jews apparently believed that leprosy was not just a physical ailment, but it was reflective of, of something spiritual as well. I've read this a lot um, through the years, how Jew Jewish followers of God believed that leprosy was a punishment for sin. And not only leprosy, but we see that in the scriptures as well, with blindness and other diseases as well. But how beautiful for that to be part of this narrative as well, that when they were healed, it is no problem for the Lord even in light of that belief. So the stumbling block of sin was no problem, problem for Jesus. Leprosy itself was no problem because God can heal the uncurable. He gives hope to the hopeless. He healed the lepers, I believe, to teach them that he's able to heal the bigger problem of sin. It was almost like an evangelistic thing, in my mind, I believe. Wow. Not only uh, this, does this mean that I can function properly and not be an outcast in society, but even the underlying accusations of sinfulness and guilt have been cured by Jesus. What an amazing miracle this was for those that were receiving it. Even the problem of sin, even the problem of displeasure of God, because People in society would have viewed the lepers, especially Jewish people, would have viewed them as being unpleasurable to God, done something wrong in their lives to put them in this situation. If you could just trust them, if you could just trust them, there is hope in helpless situations. No promise, no protest, no problem. One last point. The gain of gratitude. The gain of gratitude. Let's start with no hesitation. No hesitation. I'm pretty sure that all ten lepers were quite aware of their healing. You? I mean, if you're, if you're that uncomfortable, I mean, I, I try to put myself in the shoes of these that were sick. And I mean, we've been sick, all of us, to some degree. We get miserable, right? I mean, imagine the misery of your body falling apart and the loneliness and the yeah, I, yeah, I just can't, I can't actually imagine all the way what this must have been like. But to be healed all of a sudden or in that process of walking, to share, whoa, whoa, hold on, my hand's okay, how about you, you know? For them to be healed that way must have been quite, quite marvelous. But only one, and strangely enough, it's the look down on one, the Samaritan, the despised one of the group. He is gripped by what I call an urgent urge to give thanks. And he turns back and he goes the opposite direction of the priest. I'm just singing of that song earlier. He goes to the high priest, by the way. I asked the question of the passage, why is that? Well, because he could tell that he was clean already. He didn't need a priest to tell him that he was healed. And I just thought of this other thought from Psalm 51. Where, where the, the Bible says very plainly that God desires not the religious box to be checked, but God desires the heart. Right in the middle of David's confession, right in the middle of all this like, you know, thankfulness for the forgiveness of God, David says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. It doesn't need 
necessarily for us to go to the priest and show ourselves to the priest and be checked off as clean, do the religious duty. No, no, no. In light of this whole chapter, what God requires is your heart. And so he goes to the Savior with a sincere heart of thanksgiving. Church family, don't hesitate to thank God. Because this urge, this urgent urge fades. Have you noticed that? It's almost like a, a wave. It's a wave that comes upon us to thank the Lord. And then very quickly, we are gripped by the next thing that bothers us, the next thing to complain about, and the next thing that makes us feel uncomfortable in this world. And so when you have that little urgent urge, take that window of opportunity and grab it. The non missed the opportunity. How sad. So I thought hey, it would be horrible for us to leave church and miss the opportunity of Thanksgiving. Let me list out a few things that I want to remind you of to be thankful for. And this is an exercise that you must do yourself. I'm not going to spoon feed too much in this regard because this is a personal thing. When that urge comes, grip it. But here's a few things that I'm thankful for that I want to share with you. Health. Material blessings and comforts. Opportunities to serve the Lord. Jesus found me, rescued me from my sin. You? Deliverance from an old lifestyle. Deliverance from addiction. And you know what that feels like. I'm not talking about only the big things. I mean, we are addicted to sin because it's pleasurable we do it. And we go back to it over and over again. Whether it be sins of omission or commission. Comfort in times of loneliness and sorrow, protection from evil, sovereignty over all things for our good, a providential supply of everything we need in this life, sincere inheritance, sorry, not sincere, secure inheritance, the call of heaven on our lives, conviction for sin that results in our sanctification and being made more holy like Jesus, hope of glory, grace given in so many things, but I want to mention the Bible, the fact that God has given us his word. What, what a beautiful gift. Compassion from the Father when nobody else cares. Specific and unique gifts and abilities, blood family, church family, sufferings, hardships that are actually not wasted, but forging us to be holy and patient. Honor of being an ambassador for Jesus. Freedom to worship and to pray anytime. Privilege of being the king's servant. Joy of a relationship with God Almighty. Church family, don't hesitate to thank him. Take time to write in your journal those things for which you are grateful. No hesitation. Then, no hindrance. No hindrance. There's no reservation. There's no holding back in terms of this response of praise and thanks. Just so blessed by this. Observing a little detail in the passage. Again, warmed my heart. Praising God, he came back to Jesus. Look at that. He praised God coming back to, to Jesus. Uh, those that have a hang-up with the deity of Christ, I mean, I don't understand what's the problem here. I mean, we've got Jesus standing there in the flesh and, and receiving praise. Um, as if he were God, and receiving it, accepting that praise. It's always like this in the Bible, glory to God first, and then benefit to us, just by the way. Just see that cycle of motion in how things happen. Glory to God and benefit to us. Glory to God and benefit to us. And the two are married together. But notice the loud voice in this passage. First, they were shouting from a distance, the loud voice, their need and their desire to be healed, because they were... You know, unclean, outcasts. And now that same voice is used with energy. And the same intensity, look at the language, the same intensity now as the request is given the thanks. And we don't do that. We don't do that very well. We cry loud about our problems and loud about our complaints and our needs and our requests to God. But we're not so loud when it comes to our thanksgiving. I'm not trying to beat anyone down, but it's true. And so we need to learn with the same energy and same intensity to give our thanks and our praise to God. No hindrance. No holding back. Another little sub-point. Last one. No haughtiness. 
He fell on his face, this one Samaritan, ex-leper. At Jesus' feet, the Bible says. And notice something, that his humility was consistent. He didn't consider himself to be worthy of healing in the beginning. So he cried out to God, not feeling like he was in the context of what we talked about even last Sunday, that he was entitled to some kind of healing or worthy deserving, that's how we defined it last Sunday, of God's intervention. And now, even now, he never considered himself to be just worthy of merit, last week's message. So it's a beautiful illustration of what was spoken about last Sunday. I almost considered doing all things in one sermon, but there was way too much content. So his humility was consistent. When he received God's mercy, he's still unworthy, undeserving, no merit of my own. Hence the context here of the unworthy servant, for us to ponder these things. And I've said this already, the problem is that we are, not only in terms of our thanksgiving, but also in terms of our humility, we're very humble when it comes to asking God for things. We'll bend our knee and we'll get all tiny before God and we'll say, Lord, you know, I, I don't deserve your grace and your healing and your mercy in this situation, but Lord, please receive my humble request. But then when it comes to our thanksgiving, we're not so humble. And so the challenge of this passage is to bring our humble asking and to bring our humble getting before God in thankful, humble praise. And this should be reflected. Our, our humility should be reflected in our thanksgiving. It really should be. Amen, do you agree? Notice something special. Just a, a last little blast here from the passage. A special gain for this Samaritan ex-leper. Get up, Jesus said, and go your way. The nine were already up and gone. And so there's special gain that is given, I believe, to this one leper from Samaria, Samaritan. And that is his faith is recognized. Notice this. Your faith has made you well. Now look in your Bible closely and you'll see a little footnote there. A little tiny, in the ESV it's a little nine. Go to your footnote and you'll see the translation in your footnote because it's important. Not only did Jesus say, go and be well like the other nine, but your footnote says that this could be translated to be saved. Your faith has saved you. Could it be that this particular one who was thankful had faith sufficient for salvation as well? To be healed physically and healed spiritually on that same occasion. You see, glory to God, benefit to us, does work. Glory to God and benefit to us. There's so much more to be spoken about from this passage, like the unexpected nature of the thanker. And, and we must be careful not to always view certain people as those that are most thankful. There are people behind the scenes that are, I believe, the great thankers in a church situation. The quiet ones behind the scenes that are just constantly bringing their thanks, constantly bringing their thanks, constantly bringing their praise, constantly bringing their glory to God and giving the glory to God. Not always the most visible, the most vocal, and the ones that have the most. Sadly, it's the ones that often don't have much that are the ones that are most thankful. I don't know why that is about our heart. Something to learn there. Another point that could be expounded could be the sufficient and abundant atonement of Jesus. That I don't know. Jesus had every right to unheal the nine. Have you ever thought about that? You came to give thanks. Well done, you get healed. Those guys, back to punishment. But we have no record of that happening. Such is the magnitude of the grace of our Savior, the provenient grace of Jesus. When we gain salvation, we don't minimize the grace of God extended to others. So, so what I conclude is that our, our salvation needs to be shared. The grace that we've enjoyed needs to be shared. 
I mean, God blesses our lives. It needs to be shared with others. It's not like we're suddenly going to end up in poverty because there's no end to the grace of our God. There's no end to it. It is abundant and sufficient. And this can be applied you know, in a whole sermon, I believe. But one last little thought I had to, to close. I thought the ratio, nine to one. Just, it, it has to grip you when you read the text, the nine to one ratio. And my conclusion is the masses in our world seem to reject Jesus. The masses just get on their way. They forget about Jesus in light of the extension, the invitation for salvation. Man, if only they'd come back. If only they'd just come back to Jesus and gained all there is to be found in the giver and not the gift. In the healer and not the, not the healing. Right? And so sad that people often see that as the end of their relationship with Christ. That they come and gain some benefits from Jesus, from his good, gracious hand. But they fail to discover all that is to be discovered in the goodness of relationship with him. And the blessings of relationship with him. And that is infinitely more important than any healing they would receive from Christ. So I learned from the ratio. Ingratitude is a common sin. And so today, if you're among, or find yourself among the nine, bring Jesus your thanks. Can you do it today? Bring him your humble, praise-filled, glory-giving thanks. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this text, Lord, and thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for the privilege of allowing us to be those that would bend our knee and our heart before you and say we are unworthy and undeserving. We don't have any merit of our own to gain anything from you, whether it be your gifts, but more importantly, you. So Lord, we thank you. There's so many things that flood our minds today that would encourage and spur on our thanksgiving. And may we take this passage and allow it to guide us, Lord, to give you appropriate thanks that will be received as honor and praise to you. Amen. God bless you guys.